set it in the very center of our Christianity. One of Christ's very last directives that he offered to his disciples was to take the bread and the wine, as I understand you did last night, and to remember. We are called to do this in remembrance of him. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Remember and give thanks. This is the crux of Christianity. To remember, to give thanks, you care stale. Why? Why is remembering so important? Why is giving thanks the core of the Christ faith? Because remembering with thanks is what causes us to trust and to really believe. Remembering, giving thanks, is what makes us a member again of the body of Christ. Remembering and giving thanks is what puts us back together again in this hurried and broken and, and fragmented world in which we live. It is remembering how God has led in the past that reminds us of what he is doing in the future and keeps us focused on what he's planning for our future. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13, may be familiar to many of you. It's one of my very favorite verses in the Bible. A wonderful promise that God has given. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, Plans to give you hope and future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. In this promise, I find hope. I find hope that is I will to seek him and to come before him and to pray with him, to him. My God will take whatever weaknesses that I have and he will turn them into his strengths in order to give me a hope and to give me a future with him. For every moment, every event, every happening, it's all in Christ and in Christ we are always saved. When the bridges of life seem to give away and things are falling apart, that is when we can fall into Christ's arms and not into hopelessness. It is in his arms where it is safe to trust. There's not many things in this world that we can trust in. As we look around us, ends and his strength begins. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, My grace, my charis, is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, for that the power of Christ may rest upon As Pastor read in our scripture verse this morning, to rejoice, to be joyful. Are you joyful? You come from a church that's joy of Troy. Are you living and breathing that joy? I am so glad to hear amens. I am glad to see the smiles on your faces. Brothers and sisters, joy is an attitude that we have. It doesn't come and go like happiness does. Joy is constant. It stays. It may fade a little bit with the things that we go through life, but if our relationship with God is there, it's sure and it's steadfast and we're feeling safe, joy is there. You care stale. Rejoice always. Pray constantly, continually. Practicing the presence of God every moment of every day that we live. And to give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
It is very possible, if not probable, that you can find blessing and thanksgiving in pain. Like the Israelites, God sometimes feeds us manna, that which literally makes no sense. Is that, what is it, food? Um, I often wonder, gee, um, manna, hmm. Did one day it taste like lima beans, and the next day it tasted like lentils? Did one day it taste like carrots, and the next day it tasted like potatoes? I, I can't wait to get to heaven. I have so many questions for God. <laughs> this manna thing, I don't know. But God asks us, as he did the Israelites, to eat the mystery of circumstances that we do not understand, to take a hold of them and to embrace them. But how do we find gratefulness when we weep? Does it comfort you at all to know that in the midst of our pain, your pain, God is keeping a list? A list, you say. Hmm. It is a list that turns us in this universe in which we live inside out. It changes everything. It changes me and my perspective, and it changes my life. In Psalms 56, 8, it says, You, my God, you have recorded my troubles. You have kept a list of my tears. <laughs> God does not slumber. Thank you. For he cannot cease to bear testimony to our hurt. For when we hurt, God hurts. God keeps a list. It's the wildest love that drives the father to record his child's every lament. We never ache without God attending. And he can't stand to see one tear of ours fall to the floor. And so he cups our grief. He embraces that. And he takes our tears and puts them in a box. It's love that makes God a list keeper of our brokenness, and it's love that can make us list keeper of our blessings. And it's these lists coming together that bring us into communion with our God. In Philippians, Philippians 4, Paul invites people to rejoice in the Lord always. I'm sure that you're not too much different than I am in asking the question, always, always. When you look around and you see where our world is going and what people are facing, what you are facing, what your neighbor may be facing, what we are going through, people, we are on the verge of the second coming. Things are happening. It can be scary and it can be terrifying. But it's so filled with hope. I admit I'm scared. But I am excited at the same time because I cannot wait to see God coming in those clouds of glory. I cannot see how he's going to work things out. And I give thanks every day when I wake up in the morning and I go to bed at night and I'm thinking, what did I do? Where'd the day go? just got up and had breakfast, and now I'm going to bed. And God says that the last days are going to be quick ones. So I'm thinking, well, God, if these last days are going to be as fleeting as this day was for me, thank you. Thank you. Give thanks always. Rejoice always. Thinking about the Christians being persecuted in Rome thinking of the Christians in our day that are being persecuted on a daily basis. Even Paul himself in prison, always rejoicing and giving thanks. Even when someone I love is dying, even when I've lost my job and I have a family to feed and I don't know where bread is coming from, where is my next paycheck going to come from? I'm going to give thanks. 
giving thanks when I am on the verge of a breakdown because of the struggles and the deep hurts of life that have come in and overwhelmed me. But Paul continues and he says, do not worry. Do not worry about anything, he says. Instead, we are called to present our worries to God with thanksgiving. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 So fear for nothing. As you share your needs and your requests with Abba, our Heavenly Daddy, let an abundance of thanksgiving come from your lips. It was so refreshing to hear you just, it was just pouring out all the thanksgiving that you had this morning for the trials and the challenges, for the answers to prayer. God is sitting here. He is among us. He's listening to your testimonies and I bet he's probably busting his buttons right now for his children to praise him for the things that he has done. That you're praising him for the answers that you have yet to hear. There is a book that a friend gave to me, shared with me years ago, probably, oh, I don't know, maybe three years ago. Um, I had every intent of reading it, like I do many of my books. A good friend of mine who has traveled with me today has been in my home. And she has had the opportunity to help me make organized chaos out of unorganized chaos. And in the process of helping me to organize my library, as you would. She looked around and my husband built me bookshelves. I bought a couple of bookshelves. And in the process of all this and going through, she said to me, I leave here and there's one thing that I'm telling you that you will promise me. You will never, ever buy another book. <laughs> Doreen. <laughs> My husband looks around and he says, really? Really? And how many of these books have you read? And I said, oh, I'll do it when I retire. <laughs> Honey, you ain't retiring. I know you. There's no way. But you know what? I love books. I love the feel of them. And there's so much to be read, adventures to take, lessons to learn. This was one of those books that sat on my shelf. And it wasn't until about a year ago that as I was going through books looking for, I don't remember what it was, something for a friend that I wanted to share, I came across the book. The title of it is 1,000 Gifts, and some of you may be familiar with it. The author is Anne Voskamp. I would encourage you to read it. This woman has a relationship with God like no other. Um, and that is where my journey of Eucharisteo began. I had taken the book down from the shelf, and when she gave it to me, she said to me, this is not an easy read. So don't think you're going to pick this up and you're just going to go through it and be done. It's not an easy read, but only in the sense that it makes you think, it makes you angry, it makes you rejoice, it makes you cry, it makes you hate, it makes you love, it makes God very real. And I have been blessed. It makes you realize that one of the most important factors in thriving and living and loving and surviving and being in the very midst of God's presence is 
thanksgiving. It is where you find strength in your weakness. It is those prayers of thanksgiving that can bring miracles. This is where I'm going to begin to get raw and real. It's a little scary, but God has impressed me to do so. It's where facades are shed, masks are lifted, and souls are buried. I know many of you have probably gone through much more than what I have experienced, but we all have our stories to tell. And I'm going to share with you in just a little bit my story with you. I was born and raised in an Adventist home. I had that privilege. It was a very loving and caring home. Um, I got to be who I was. It was a God-fearing home. I was a prayed-for baby. My mother had three miscarriages between my brother and myself, and I was not to be born. The doctor said, you can't do this. You're going to lose your life. And she prayed. She said, God, I want a little girl so badly. Here I am. Thank you. You didn't have to raise me. Um, <laughs> Um, it wasn't all peaches and cream. Getting to my teen years, I began to spread my wings a little bit, and even into my 20s, um, exploring what the world had to offer. I made some very unwise choices, and I stand here with firm belief that it was not, if it was not for God and his protective hand over me, I probably would not be standing here today before you. There are times that I brought lots of tears and heartache to my parents. And dare I say, I'm, I'm proud and I'm humbled to know that I was never shamed or blamed for any of the unwise choices I made. I was continued to be loved. I was expected to make wiser choices. I was disciplined, don't get me wrong, but I was still loved, and I am grateful. Sadly enough, as Christians, we are not exempt. Regardless of what anyone tells you, we are not exempt from the hardships of life. We are not exempt from trials, addictions, sickness, disease. Just because we're a Christian. I believe that even though I have a relationship with Christ, even though I am baptized, even though I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, there are so many people that feel that if you're that, if you are baptized and you're truly converted and, you're, and you've surrendered all, that addictions go away, hardships go away. You pray to God, he answers. If, if you have that, you're golden, you're good. It's not true. There's no religion, there's no denomination that is going to save you, that is going to offer you grace and mercy and forgiveness as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's our relationship. It's not the religion you are. It's not the denomination that you belong to. It is your raw, real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where the rubber meets the road, my brothers and sisters. That's what it's about. When people ask me my beliefs, where I stand, I am a Christian first. I pray in my heart. And I happen to be a Seventh-day Adventist second. Now, if you can show me another church that has more truth, show me, and I'll be there. I have yet to find it. But I am a Christian first. Let's take a look at some of the people in the Bible. We're talking about hardships and uh, 
trials and struggles. Look at David. David was after God's own heart. He was God's boy. He was his man. And yet what David do? A murderer? An adulterer? And yet God embraced him and loved him. Moses, he was a murderer, and yet he led his people to the promised land, God's people to the promised land. And then there's Thomas, doubting Thomas. Jesus standing right there in front of him. He's going, I want to know about this. I just really don't know. He had to touch Jesus before he would believe. And then Peter. Wow. I can't begin to imagine the grief that Peter felt that evening. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, well, of course I love you. Jesus, do you really love me, Peter? Jesus, of course I do. I, I really love you. And then he says, Jesus says, but do you really, really love me, Peter? And Peter says, God, I, Jesus, I am with you. I am walking with you. I'm supporting you. I've got your back. I'm going to be there for you. And when that rooster crowed, Peter realized he had denied his Christ three times. Did God still love him and embrace him? You betcha. He was there. Paul says, why do I do the things that I don't want to do, and why can't I do the things that I want to do? We struggle. We all have our own demons that we struggle with. And yet, God still loves us and stands by us. He understands. He's walked this earth. And woven through these stories, especially Psalms, you look at David, the thanksgiving that was given, that was lifted up to God, the thanks for grace and forgiveness and for mercy and protection and peace, prayers of thanksgiving where they found strength and weakness. We look at the end of Jesus' earthly life. Jesus himself bends the knee in the garden and he weeps his own song. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup from me. He had agreed to come here. He knew what his purpose was. It was getting hard. And he's saying, Daddy, please, if there's any other way, God came to save humanity, and he drinks a cup of suffering for joy. For joy, for joy then, for now, and forever. Jesus was conceived in grateful humanity and humility, and Jesus faces death in grateful humility. My question to you is, will you open your hand to release your will to receive his into your life? To accept the gift of now as it is, to accept God. For you can't be receptive to God unless you receive what he gives. My question is, what is it that he's giving you now? Is it joy? Is it happiness? Is it, is it just all bread and butter and peaches and cream? Is it hardship? Is it cancer? Is it losing a job? Is it losing your husband? Is it an abusive situation? What is it that God is giving you now? Or allowing, I should say. Because it was never God's intent for us to suffer. 
Never, never. But we had an adversary that is roaring. He is out there. We see it every day. This life we live and the journey that we are on, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. And the life and the journey that Jesus was on was not about him, but it was about us. We are a piece in the puzzle of this life. Just one tiny piece. Have you ever put a, a thousand piece puzzle together? Ho, oh, boy. Ho. Oh, it takes a long time. Especially it's one that's got everything is blue or pink or white or whatever. We are just one piece. I know myself. I pray and it's just like, God, can you do this? You got to put this piece in like right now. And God says, but you don't see the whole picture. You don't see that whole puzzle that's out there. I'm using you. And so before I can put in your piece, there's a couple other pieces over here that I have to put in place. Because what you're going through affects what's happening over here. The hard strip, hardships and the struggles, the diseases, the addictions, everything that we're going through on this life is for a purpose. And it may be to bring someone closer to Jesus, to experience him for the very first time. Maybe for the second time, maybe for the 30th time. Maybe it's to bring you into a closer relationship with Jesus, or maybe to just be a blessing others. Again, we all have our stories to tell. And when you talk about a vulnerable, vulnerability and sharing what your story is, as unpretty as it may be, you have no idea who you're going to affect and how you can minister to the person that sits next to you. We all come to church on Sabbath morning and we say to each other, how are you? I'm fine. I was just diagnosed with cancer last week, but I'm fine. How are you this morning? Oh, I'm doing so well. My husband left me this week, but I'm fine. We laugh, but how true is it? We have no idea of the hurts that people are going through. We have this facade on, this mask, that everything is fine. Because as Christians, we are not to suffer. We are not to go through hardship. We have Jesus on our side. Please, I mean no disrespect, and I'm not being sacrilegious. But is that not the truth? When you start to spend time to talk with someone, you find out what their story is and it's raw, and it's real, and you find out that you are going through the same thing. You can encourage, you can support each other. That's what we're here for. God did not make us an island unto ourselves. We are to journey together, not alone. And if everything is hunky-dory fine, well, congratulations. But if it's not, can you be vulnerable? Can you be real? Can you share your story? I don't mean that you have to stand up in church and announce it to everybody. But to be real and know that people are struggling. Sin is present. It's, it's evident. It's everywhere. It's at work. And however it raises its ugly head. And when we share our stories, we can gather hope. We're able to pray with one another. It's awesome. So why would you, when you have the opportunity, when someone asks you, and, and I try so hard, now I will be, tend to be one of these people because I have so many things on my list to do. 
to say, how are you today? And in all sincerity, I do want to know. We may not have time to talk now, but I do want to know how you're doing. Are you struggling? How can I pray for you today? And that's another opportunity that presents itself. How can I? I had a friend of mine say that to me for the very first time about a year and a half ago. I didn't know what to say. She said, how can I pray for you today? I didn't know what to say. What a blessing it is to be able to pray for someone else. Don't rob someone of that blessing. If you can pray for them and help them. It was about a month ago. Things weren't going well in my life. It was looking pretty dark and drear. Life was taking its toll. Some things were going on, and I stood in my kitchen, and uh, I didn't know if I really wanted to face tomorrow. And I was very scared. I stood there, and I felt like I was on the verge of a breakdown. And I thought, me, come on. Life became so heavy. And I just didn't I just didn't want to face what tomorrow or that evening was going to bring. I was tired and I just wanted it to all go away. And I was so scared. And I thought, what am I going to do? It was like I didn't know. I didn't know what to think. I, I, and in all honesty, prayer was the farthest thing from my mind, sadly enough. And oddly enough, I turned and I looked at the clock in my kitchen, and it was a God thing. There was no two ways about it. It was a God thing. I looked at my clock, and I said, thank you, God for my clock on the wall. Thank you for the time that it represents. And then I looked at my stove and I said, God, thank you for my stove that I can cook food. And then it was my refrigerator, my refrigerator. Thank you, God, for my refrigerator and it's full of food. Thank you for the blue spruce that's outside that started as a wee little thing and I have grown up with that is this big, majestic spruce tree that I enjoy every morning. Do you see a pattern? I started giving thanks. Eucharisteo. There was a moment, it was hard. I, I, I was like, I'm giving thanks. And it was like my mind wanted to go back to this deep, dark hole that I was falling into. And I didn't want to go there because I was afraid of what might hold for me. And I was fighting with myself, with the adversary. And I said, no, I, I have to focus on Thanksgiving. Thank you for my couch. Thank you for this home that represents family and represents love. And as I was starting to give thanks, I started to feel a peace of God come over me. And I thought, Lene, Eucharisteo has become such a part of your life. How did you forget that? God is good. He's absolutely incredible. And I, I felt my face, and I was smiling. I was, I was smiling. The tears were gone, and I was smiling. And it was just like, God, you were so incredible. Thank you so much. Standing there in my kitchen, on the verge of not knowing whether I was going to face tomorrow or not, and the choice that I was going to make, that prayer of thanksgiving, 
in my weakness, gave me God's strength. To me, it was truly a miracle. It was a miracle. I, I was like, here I was for that quote of depths of despair. And some of you may have experienced that. I can't begin to tell you how crippling it felt. And in like three minutes, life was good. Joy came to the surface. I was rejoicing. It is very possible, if not probable, that you can find blessing even in pain. In the practice of giving thanks, Eucharisteo, this is the way that we practice the presence of God, to stay present in his presence. And it is always a practice of the eyes, for it is not what we see, but how we see. We can give thanks in everything because there is a good God who is leading and working all things for good. It is in his arms where it is safe to trust. Martin Luther said that God created the world out of nothing, and as long as we are nothing, he can make something out of us. And how true that is to empty ourselves. Are we nothing? Yeah, pretty much. But it is because of God that we are something. We have a purpose. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. We have a purpose in life. God didn't make us to just sit on the pew or to just exist. We're going home, brothers and sisters. I'm going home. Do you want to go home? Fulfill what God has given you, which is a hope and a future in him, something that is fruitful. There is power in prayer. There is power in the prayer of thanksgiving. I have seen it, and I have experienced it. It's a huge part of my life. Finding strength in the prayer of thanksgiving at my very weakest and lowest of lows brought me from darkness into light. Prayer costs us nothing, but the rewards are out of this world. Do not forget that. Yes, eucharisteo is a word that is part of my daily vocabulary. And I will always have those words on my lips. It keeps me focused and in the very presence of my Abba. As I go throughout the day, and I am I am encountering different things. It may be that plant that I am giving thanks for. It, it, it gives off oxygen to, for me to breathe. He created that. It's beautiful. It's beauty in my eyes. I am grateful for that. I'm practicing his presence because I am giving him thanks. His name is upon my lips. For it is in my weakness that I find his strength. Let us rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please turn to hymn number 488, and let's stand.
again, Father God, thank you for being in our presence this morning. Thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. No matter where our journey takes us, no matter how we respond to the trials and the challenges that you give to us, may we rejoice always. May we continually practice your presence in our life. Lord, as we worship you, let us humble ourselves before you. For we have no good apart from ourselves. Let us remember that in every season that you have provided, that we can trust your promises. That we will set aside our fear, Lord, for all the good that you've given, for every sin forgiven, and for eternity with you, we will give you thanks. For gratitude changes everything, Lord. Thank you for hearing prayers, for changing lives, for walking with us, and coming to take us home. Amen.